lot from plot, believe it or not. Stuff that happens in this last section. Remember, it's Lord Wilder's universe. He's deciding what's happening. He's making these things happen. And it's going to have a lot specifically to do with plot with Brother Day. And then, if you've got something that's not complementary, I want something that is complementary. I don't want it to all be young. I want some young in there. So, <clears throat> what's the tone towards this one? That's not as much plot as her thoughts. That would be characterization. Characterization, yeah. Because she's not really doing anything. She's sitting there thinking when you get the toe exhibited. So the good news is, if you didn't get much of this book, you only need to really get the last 10 pages for this paper. Now, let's help each other write this paper. As I said, it's going to be based on class lecture, so you can say the right answers right now. And I'll say, yeah, that's the right answer. I'll say, no, you're on the wrong track. So taking notes right now would really be helpful. The more you guys talk, the more I'll talk, the more I'll help you. So don't be afraid of just saying what you think. If you have a totally wrong answer, it doesn't matter. No to be helping people write their papers. All right, what's the big plot action that happens in these last few pages that might convey an attitude towards the church? Yeah? That's got to be it. They burn Brother Judah. Let's see if you guys pick out this contradiction. The church burns Brother Juniper alive because he did something heretical. Heretical is the word they use. Does anybody know what a heretic is? That's it. That's it. So how did he go against the church? That's it. Trying to figure out what God's intentions are, what God wants, is heretical. You shouldn't try to figure out what God wants. You shouldn't try to figure out why God does the things that God does. You shouldn't try to read God's mind. That's heretical. All right, check out this contradiction. The church says that, but then they burn Brother Juniper because that's what God would want. How do they know that that's what God would want? Well, they can read his mind. Who can read his mind? The archbishop, the powers that be in the church. But isn't it heretical to read God's mind? Yes, it is. Let me do that one more time. I'll take your question. They burned Brother Juniper because he tried to read God's mind. And it's heretical to try to read God's mind. Well, how do they know that they should really burn Brother Juniper? Well, clearly, that's what God would want. Did God send you a telegram? Did God call you up on your cell phone and say, Mother, burn Mother Juniper? No. They can just tell that that's what God would want. They can read God's mind. But that should be heretical. So they're doing the very thing that they're claiming Brother Juniper shouldn't do. If God had sent down, burn Brother Juniper like a voice from a cloud, or like a sign that appeared in the sky in the shapes of clouds, burn Lilla Juniper, or something like that, then I guess the church wouldn't be guilty of a contradiction. Because they could say, we're not trying to read God's mind, he told us. But as we 
all know God doesn't work that way. There's always a gap between what we think God wants and what God may really want. That's why religion is so mysterious. But that doesn't bother the church. They'll blame Brother Juniper for being heretical, and then they themselves do the very same thing. You had a question, sir. Well, I was going to say I feel like that he's like he's toned towards the church as if the church is hypocritical. That's right. His tone towards the church, his attitude towards the church is that they are guilty of being hypocritical. Furthermore, how do the other people react when Brother Juniper is heard a lot? This is important. This helps establish the tone. The villagers from Puerto, the ones that didn't die in the plague, they're sitting there watching this little guy burn alive, and they're just shocked. Because they know he was a good man who had really strong faith. They can't believe the church hierarchy would burn him alive. They know because they know him well. He truly is a man of faith. And even some people from the city who didn't know him very well, they were watching him burn alive and they can tell he's a man of faith because of the way he burns alive. And that's an important plot. What does he do right before he succumbs to the flames? Yes, sir? He said it, I thought. Yes. Yeah. He smiles. Excellent. He leans into that flame with a smile on his face. That guy couldn't do that unless he was convinced that there's a God that's going to heaven. So the people that watch him burned alive. They're thinking, man, the church is making a mistake here. And we're supposed to think that too. Now, there may be one little factoid from earlier in the book that you might want to unearth and bring forward. And maybe it was just a sentence in your paper. But who represents the story, the power of the church? There's one character. The Archbishop. Now think about the Archbishop's character. There's one sin that he commits openly. There's others that he commits secretly. But what's the one big sin he commits openly? Sort of what he's known for. Badness? It's not a sin to be bad. <laughs> He's always shown stuffing extra food in his face even though there's people starving. So he's not exactly practicing religion as it's meant to be practiced. Brother Juniper is clearly more religious, more caring and loving than the Archbishop. And yet the Archbishop gives the order to burn this guy. Why do you think they really burned Brother Juniper? Yeah? Are they afraid of people coming to the that actually finding out what God wants and afraid that it might not be the right thing that they think he wants? You know, that'd be nice if they really believed in God. But for a while there may be showing us that big fat archbishop who has affairs with women and blood and, and so forth. He may be showing us that that guy doesn't even necessarily believe in God. He just happens to be in a very powerful position. What one is he afraid of? That's it. That's it. Exactly. That he may take some of their power he may have a lot of followers who just end up hanging out with him. Now, 
Brother Juniper is not that smart. You see that. He's very religious. He's a, completely a faithful believer. But he's really not that smart. And they convince him that he was tricked into writing this book. The church does. And it's not very hard for them to do. Because he's so faithful, he never questions the power structure. He's not a rebel. He's not a revolutionary. He really wrote this book to try to help the church. If you had told him, all right, we're going to put our name on it, and we're going to take the book from you, and we're going to put the archbishop's name on it, he would have been like, okay. He wouldn't have had any problem. He has no ego. So they tell him, you know, you shouldn't have done this because this is trying to see inside God's thinking that's heretical. And he said, oh, is it? I, I didn't know that. Oh, my God. Oh, goodness. And they're like, the devil got you to do this. And he's like, oh, you're right. The devil did get me to do this. I was tricked by the devil. Oh, I was tricked by the devil. But he says that he hopes people realize one thing, that even though he was tricked by the devil, he had good what? Intentions. Yes. And that's why you have perhaps an intention. He knows in his heart that his intentions were pure. And that's why he can smile and lean into that flame, because he knows God will know his intentions were pure. And that even if the devil tricked him into writing the book, he didn't mean to be heretical. And he's okay with being burnt alive, because to him, no big deal. He's going to go see God. He's not afraid of death. Now, if he was more savvy and intelligent and sophisticated, he could argue with the church, but they're still going to burn him alive. They wouldn't have saved him. But he could have given them a good comments before he went. We don't get that. So he comes off as an easy victim. The church comes off as really despicable in their use of violence. Think about this big fat contradiction. For those that are in, you know, from the Christian side of things, the Christian tradition, even if you're not, you probably know it's a huge religion out there. And they have this guy, Jesus, who's the supposedly head of their religion. Jesus was absolutely nonviolent. Absolutely nonviolent. When they come to nail Jesus to the cross, one of Jesus' disciples, James, pulls out a sword, swings at one of the Romans, cuts off a Roman guard's ear. Jesus tells James, his disciple, put the blade of your sword, picks that ear up off the ground. It's the last miracle Jesus performs and reattaches it to the guard's ear. The very guy who's going to nail him to the cross. So it's pretty clear that he took Jesus' stuff seriously. You've got to be like Martin Luther King. You've got to be like Gandhi. It's completely nonviolent protocols. And think of the history of the church. The church has been violent. The church had an army during the Crusades. The church rode into the Middle East to kill Muslims with crosses on their shirts. Kill Muslims. So it's not as though this is the first time the church has ever been run up for being hypocritical. And again, almost all religions suffer this. So it's not like we're just pointing at the Catholic Church. Organized religions in general tend to advocate one set of rules for their followers, and then they'll have another set of rules for the people in charge. And that's really what Gordon Wilder is pointing out. He's not picking on Catholicism specifically. Now, she's a Catholic. She's part of the church. She has to go and deal with the archbishop all the time. She has to go and beg for money for her orphanage, and there's the guy stuffing his face. And she has kids that are literally starving at her orphanage. She will give her a few cents to feed them. How does she come off? Well, you're going to do a little work right now in class. She goes from being good, very good, and in these last pages she moves from being very good 
to Satan like. Through the whole book, she's a very, very, very good woman. She's the most likable woman in the whole book. She's smart, quite as smart as Brother Juniper. She knows how the world works. She understands the corruption of the church. She still works within the church to do good. Um, if people could read her mind, they'd think that she was heretical too, but she's smart enough to never write a book or say anything. She goes and gets the money from the archbishop and keeps her mouth shut. She really works to help these children. And that's her life. But there's one little part of her that's, I wouldn't call it selfish, but it's at least self interested Self-interested. And she has what Gordon Wilder calls an idol in her heart. Are there any practicing Jews in the room? Anybody from the Jewish tradition? Okay, what do you guys think about idols? Not supposed to like worship idols. That's right. They're bad. Was the Jewish tradition around before or after Christianity? Before. Way before. So there's a lot of similarities between Christianity and Judaism, right? Yeah. We stole a lot of your good stuff. Jesus was a Jew. One of the good things that we stole from you is we said also, you're not supposed to have idols. But we don't do a very good job of that. If you've ever been in a Catholic church, they're lined up all down the walls, statues. And if you've ever been in a Catholic church, usually there's a cross with a figure of Jesus on it that he considered an idol. If you go into a Protestant church, they scale back on that stuff. They do a better job of not worshiping idols. So idol here is not a good thing. It's got a negative connotation. So she has something in her heart which is not pure. Something other than love of God something other than love of just doing God's will. It's a secret little something that she has in her heart that's a little self-interested, not selfish. She's a very, very good person, even with the idol in her heart. But it prohibits her from rising to that level of saint-like person. I want you guys to take a few minutes here, ten minutes, and think over, find in those last pages, what was the idol in her heart? How does she get rid of it? And how does that make her a better person? And those little lines are going to be in your paper. Go ahead, pop your book open. Try to find that section. the word idol. Or Jordan Wilder uses the word idol. Did I take your book? You're very polite. Right? You yell at me. Sorry.
anybody think they found what I was looking for? Wow. Wow. Yeah, let me give uh, people another minute to look. They've got about half. Yes. 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 The idol in her heart is her orphanage and her name attached to the orphanage and the orphanage surviving into the future after her death still being run the way she wants it run. And she had a plan in order to make that happen. Because once she was dead, how could she run the orphanage the way she wanted it run? From Pete down. And she realizes now, sitting in that church, that that was wrong. That that was self-interested. That was to be interested in herself. The idol, other, an idol is just something other than God that you worship. The idol that she was worshiping was a good thing, so she was still a very good person to have this idol in her heart, because the idol she was wor worshiping was an orphanage to take care of kids. So you can hardly say that that's a bad person if that's the most important thing to them, right? But if you're really going to be a purely religious person, that shouldn't be the most important thing to you. The most important thing to you should be God. Now. Tone is exhibited here through her thoughts. Once she extinguishes that, she rips that idol out of her heart. It's painful for her, but it makes her firmer. And then what does she do right after she's done doing that? She can do it without moving. She prays. She doesn't cry. She doesn't slump her shoulders. She goes right back to God. Now you've got a great contrast here between the church, which is supposedly doing God's business, and this lowly peon in the church who's really doing God's business. Because she's a woman, she's not taken seriously. But she's obviously the most religious person in the book. She understands God better than anybody else. She understands really what it is to be religious. She doesn't question God. She says maybe it was enough to have something that flowered and then faded. She realizes that the orphanage, now that the is dead, is not going to be run the way that she wanted. And even if Pepita was alive, it would have been wrong to put on that little girl's shoulders all of her expectations. What Pepita really needed was a mom, somebody who could just love her. What she didn't need was instruction on how to clean floors, make beds, keep books, hire people, run with efficiency. That's not what the Peter needed. The reason why she got that instruction was the idol in this very good woman's heart. It was a worldly thing, something of this world. 
which is not what you're supposed to worship if you're really religious. You're supposed to turn your heart and your eyes to the mystery of God only. So this woman goes from being very, very good to saint like, and nobody knows it but us, the readers. If you don't believe me, at the end of the book, when Donna Clara, the Marquise's daughter, comes back, and the Paracol comes, and they're all with this woman, they're all surrounded by that woman, and they're all made better people just from being in proximity of her. And if you think I'm exaggerating with the same kind of thing, read the passage about the people that are dying. There's a bunch of people that are there dying. What does it have to say about them? Yes? I have a question. Um, so, like, you're saying Rachel started to pray, she became saint-like? As soon as she ripped the idol out of her heart and started to pray, that minute, yeah, she became saint-like. And then we see that saint-like, and I really mean it, like, beyond human. We see that saint-like ability in the description of the people that are dying in the little hospital orphanage. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, you get to digest that. The people that are dying under her care would not trade health to be away from. She radiates so much, so I'm trying to find the word, spiritual warmth, that they would rather stay in proximity to her in pain, physical pain, and on the, the verge of death, than be moved away from her and been given help. Yes? They would not trade help. Isn't that radical? I mean, that's radical. I would. I'd want my health back. You're a nice lady and all, but uh, can I have my health back? Apparently, these people feel so close to God when they're near her that they'd rather stay there and die a painful death and just be close to her than be moved out of the hospital and given their health back. If there was some miraculous way you could cure them from tuberculosis or whatever they have. They wouldn't take the cure. We'd rather be right here in this hospital dying near her. Now, is that true? Yeah, it's true in this book because Thornton Wilder made this book. He's making all of this happen. He's expressing an attitude towards her and it's one of supernatural reverence. It's only the thing that so a god like saint, super religious person who didn't part. And that's really what you're going to be writing about. You only have three pages and you don't have to do a lot of summary. You're writing to somebody who knows the book. You don't even really need to talk about the bridge of San Luis Rey break. You're writing to somebody who knows the book. You don't even need to give me a big, long explanation of who she is. You're writing to somebody who knows that's going to help you. So I think you could probably do this in two pages. I said earlier, two and a half, because I wanted to give you a little room to talk about this, and talk about this, and then maybe a half page to sort of compare and contrast those tones. What this shows us is that Hogan Love is not just condemning, he's not condemning religion wholesale, because she's religious. Thor Walder, by the way, is the biographical fact. Very religious. Very much a believer in God. And again, he's not attacking organized religion. He's attacking organized religion as it existed in South America several hundred years ago. Does the church burn people alive now? Yeah. We've got no one. Okay, I'll type this up into a rubric. About 20 points are going to be just for using the word tone correctly. And you really want to zero in on that last definition. You guys have to keep right?
we'll talk a little bit more about that definition tomorrow. What you can do for homework tonight, why not take the easier one, the church, and try to sum up Lord Wallace's quote. You're going to need one quotation, one good quotation for that. Why not find a quotation that you think really expresses his attitude towards this church? Yeah. Should we start writing the paper? Or? Yeah, why don't you write a paragraph tonight? Bring it in for me. Yeah, I may collect it as a grade. Just one, just give it a try. Yeah. Yeah, double space everything. I've got bad eyes. It's hard for me to read. The church thing. Just spend 20, 30 minutes on it. Give me one paragraph. Something that you'd be willing to read aloud in class so we can go around and sort of see how we're doing on this. Yeah? So you want to like write, like start writing that paper and just write about that? Just write about that, like jump into the middle of it. Okay. Right. Like the first thing you could say is the tone that Thornton Wilder exhibits towards the church in the final chapter is, and then just say it and then try to defend that. Now, here's my last hint for you guys. Writing about tone, you really need to think about the word you pick precisely. It can't be as informal as it is when I'm just talking up here. If I was writing this paper, I really would go to the thesaurus, and I'd spend 10, 15 minutes trying to find the exact right word to sum up what he said. Like, hypocritical tone, that's close. And I would go and look up the word hypocrisy and try to find a word that's the exact right one. Yeah, spend 20, 30 minutes on this. That's it. Boom, boom, boom. Put your name on it, bring it in. Boom, boom, boom. One paragraph. Some people, oh, some people have theirs today. Yeah, some people have theirs. I have mine tomorrow. Well, let you guys yeah, vote tomorrow. Because um, two days ago, we didn't have science. So we didn't know about it. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Are you in Bernie's class? Yeah. Yeah. Why would I not want it? I first read my notes over. Yes. All right, not being caught up on the reading. I have to study like five things. I'm uploading the um video to YouTube, okay? Okay. Uh, That's in the link. And we out.